Hey, it's so good to have you join us here for the second Sunday of the year. And last week we heard from Pastor Brian Houston, and man, what a what a word that was. And I'm just so honored and privileged to be able to share with you here my first Sunday and um, being able to preach in this year. Here we are, 2021. Guys, we made it. We made it. We got here 2021, and I cannot think of a year where we've allocated more to the actual year than any other year. I mean, we have kind of like all thought of 2020 as a house that is on fire that we need to get out of. And we are finally out and we are now in 2021. I mean, has there ever been a year like this? I mean, I do remember those of you that are old enough, you, you might remember this as well, but I do remember going into year 2000. That was a big year as well. I remember 1999. We all thought the world was going to end, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not old enough for this, if you're a bit younger, let me just tell you. In 1999, we all had this idea that every computer in the world was going to stop working. And we're going to wake up on the 1st of January 2000 with no phones, no internet, not nothing, not a single computer. All right, now... You gotta know my family to understand this story, but I um, I was raised in a very Christian home. And um, and I remember as we're getting closer to year 2000, suddenly my dad said to me, you know what son, this could be the year that Jesus comes back. I'm like, all right dad. So he's like, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's be there when we go into year 2000, because who knows if he comes back, we're gonna have front row seats. I'm 18, I mean 18 or 19, I'm like, Sounds great. So we fly to Jerusalem. And you know, you know when you sit around and everyone's telling stories about different things and you just have this random story? Like, I don't know how many times I sat around and people talked about, hey, where were you, you know, at this event? Where were you at this event? And then someone will say, where were you when we went into year 2000? And one person will have this crazy story and we celebrated like this and we celebrated like that. Thomas, what did you do when you went into year 2000? Well, I was at a hotel in Bethlehem <laughs> and um, for some reason I decided that I was gonna cut my hair. So I had my friend use a shaver on my hair. It died, like it literally broke halfway through. So we cut my hair to about up to here and then the shaver broke and we couldn't do anything. Because of that, I missed the bus that went to Jerusalem. So what did I do? New Year's Eve going into year 2000? I was walking with a half shaved head from Bethlehem to Jerusalem when we celebrated going into the new millennium. I know, crazy. So here we are in year 2021. And um, I don't know what your New Year's Eve was like. I know for us, we were just with our family and just with our kids and you know we had just tried to have a dance party and we just put them to bed and you know we in Denmark there's fireworks everywhere and so I decided you know I was going to stay up until the fireworks had died down and the kids were slowly falling asleep and I was sitting out in the living room and I was just sitting by myself Kat had already gone to bed and it's kind of just like finally it was probably the first time the whole day was a bit of silence just trying to gather my thoughts a bit and you know, you get into that reflective mode at 2 a.m. <laughs> where you're kind of just thinking about the day and the weeks and now the year that has gone. And I don't know about you, but I felt like New Year's Eve, for me, it felt very much like a finishing line. We we're finally there, we crossed this finishing line, but at the same time, it was as if the, where the finishing, where the race ended, the new race began. Where, 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 where we reached the finishing line, it was as if straight away we were, going down and starting on the starting blocks of a brand new race. And I think all of us, we have to remember that we are constantly living in this tension between the now and the not yet. We're constantly living in this tension between things that have been completed or being completed, being completed, and things that we are still hoping and dreaming for us. We came out of 2020, I mean, 2021 is not even two weeks old and we already have just a truckload of challenges that have already presented itself globally, nationally, and I bet even personally, 
Uh, I know for, for many of us, we're now homeschooling kids and trying to get the whole life and the balance of life to, to, to you know, to be, to be together and to have find peace in that and, and just to make sure that everyone's happy and we're really moving on and, and being strong in this season. And I think when it comes to tension, when it comes to challenges in life, it's easy to, to wanting to run away from it. And especially if you're younger, uh, this might have been something brand new, pain. And, you know, I think we have this uh, illusion that all pain is bad. And so when it comes to a whole season of pain, when it comes to a whole season of challenges, often we can find ourselves only seeing all the, all the negative stuff about it. But I'll say there's also some good that's come out of this year. There's some good that's come out of 2020. There's something that we can, if we can learn to move past the pain, we can actually grow out of it as well. And I think one of the good things that comes out of seasons of challenges is exposure. Things get revealed. When you are in crisis, when you are in tension, things that maybe you can hold inside of you, things that maybe you're good at hiding, things that maybe you, know, you, you can just keep you know, pushed down. It's amazing how tension brings it out. Tension, it reveals, it exposes, it reveals the good stuff and reveals the not so good stuff. It reveals character. Just like moments of great need that demands great leadership, it will reveal whether leadership is present. I know as a, as a leader myself, I'm always interested in, in moments of crisis, in moments of, you know, challenges. I'm always interested and curious to see who rises to the occasion and who doesn't? Because it's amazing how often the ones you think are gonna rise up, they know where to be found. And suddenly out of nowhere, someone rises up that you had never expected. It's amazing how seasons of crisis and tension and challenges, it exposes and it reveals. 2020, it exposed many things. It brought many things to the forefront again and many of the things that have been mentioned and highlighted in the medias and news and social media over the last 12 months. But I think two of the greatest, greatest things that have been revealed are your friends and your character. Those are two of the greatest things that 2020 really have revealed in all of us who our true friends are and what is our character like. We have experts telling us around the world, choose your five, choose your 10, choose your circle, make sure that you have your five, make sure you have in some countries your two, your three. And it seems so limited and I, I, I get it and I, I feel it, of course it's limited. But I also think that the government or the experts, they're doing us a favor. But if you, because if we can learn to choose the right five, if we can learn to choose the right 10, it is amazing the favor that will go with that. I mean, there is an old saying that says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Proverbs 27, 17 says it like this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Truth is your future, it is shaped by your five. It is shaped by your 10. It is shaped by the close circle that you keep and that you choose to keep your relationship, your thinking, your belief, your, your, your confidence, all of that is directly influenced by the voices in your life that you choose to listen to. I wonder who your five is. I wonder who your five, 10, your five or your 10. I wonder who your circle is. The ones that in your life that you choose to listen to, the ones in your life that you choose to let you be sharpened by. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Apostle Paul says, don't be misled, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. You can have great character, but then you get around people that just have a different value system than you. And slowly but surely, it deteriorates your good character. On top of that, I mean, crisis has given us a mirror as well that we could look at our lives with and you know then in our own lives as christians we have another mirror that reveals what is going on inside of us the bible it is described as many things the bible is described as soap as water ephesians says that it's water that washes our mind 
who knows there's a lot of stuff that gets in there that it's just it needs a good washing <laughs> you know it, it, it's described as water that washes our mind the Bible is described as a hammer hammering you know old thinking down bad thinking down bad mindsets is described as a as a hammer but it's also described as a sword Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 it says the word of God is alive and is active that's important to remember that that the Bible the Bible is not just ink on paper it's living it, it, it that's why when we say read the Bible every day it's not just so that you can read ink on paper. It's not just about information. It's about transformation. It's about revelation. Because when you get this into you, it's alive. Now it's moving. It's active. And the Bible says it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So the, so the Bible describes itself like a surgeon's scalpel. You know, like a surgeon has a knife and cuts away infection and cuts, you know, fine cuts to make sure that anything that doesn't belong there can be cut out and can be exposed. See, the Bible exposes us. I don't know about you, but... I have a daily habit of reading my Bible. And often when I read my Bible, maybe I shouldn't say this as a preacher, make sure you listen to the whole context and don't just take a sound bite right now. But often when I read my Bible, I don't leave encouraged. If anything, I leave convicted. You know, you sit there and you're like, oh my goodness, because the Bible is a mirror. You look at it and you look at yourself and you know, I, I, I feel convicted and it's like I'm, I'm being arrested by the Bible. My hands are up. I'm arrested. I'm guilty. I know I have things I need to work on. This morning, I, uh, I was reading this beautiful uh, psalm that describes God and therefore describes Jesus, who is our example to become like. And in Psalm 145, verse 8, it says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. And I read that this morning. I read it in the middle of homeschooling. <laughs> I read it in the middle of dealing with drama at home. I read it in the aftermath of me reacting rather than responding in the frustrations of the season and the frustrations of the, of the day. I'm reading these words, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, it's like a sword <laughs> right in the heart. And I have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. When you read the word, we have a responsibility. James chapter one, verse 22, it says, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James says, so many of us, we're like, could you imagine like waking up and looking in the mirror and seeing, you know, something on your face or you've had lunch and then you look in the mirror and you see like salad sticking out of your teeth and mustard on your, you know, your cheek and, and you wouldn't just look at that and go, oh, well, and then keep walking. But that's what James says to many of us we do. We read the word and we see attitude, we see bad manners, we see bad thinking, we see destructive habits, and we go, oh well, and keep living our lives in that way. Come on, we have a responsibility to make sure that we live this out. We've reached the finishing line of 2020. Some of us, we're licking our wounds from this year that's gone by, but we also realize that we're not there yet in so many areas of our lives. There's still so much we decide to see God do in our lives, in our character, in our marriages, in our businesses, in our ministries, in our churches. And as I was sitting in, that, in our living room, New Year's Eve, I thought of this verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where it says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. I don't know what you're looking at right now that is causing you pain. 
Today, one of my friends lost his brother to cancer. And obviously in my context, that reminds me of when I lost my brother and the pain of that. And it just, again, it's just another reminder. We live in a broken world. All is not well. Bad things happen to good people. And there was a side to this where we just got to re realize that this world will never be all well. We live on this side of eternity and there is pain on this side of eternity and there's things we've got to deal with. But there's also another side to it and that is God is not finished with his work yet. God is still at work. And if you come out of 2020 and there's been things that God has spoken to you about, then you got to realize that if you haven't reached that finishing line yet in the way that you thought that it was going to be, God has not finished yet. He is still at work. He is still working your marriage. He is still at work in your mind. He is still at work in your ministry. He is still at work in your business. He is still at work in your family. He is still at work in your finances. He is still at work in your family. He is still at work in your health. God is still at work. He is still God. And whatever He began to do, He will carry on to completion to complete, not like this will do, that will do, it, it near enough, is close enough, no, 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 to completion. And that finishing line, while it was a finishing line, it was also a starting block because God is not just at work in what he has promised, but he's also up to something brand new. As I was sitting there New Year's Eve and I was thinking about Philipp Philippians chapter one, verse six, my mind started wondering, my spirit started wondering to the very next letter of Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Can I just encourage you today by saying God has not been dethroned. God has not been fired. God has not been evacuated. And while the battle is on, he is still present. One of God's name, names is Jehovah Shammah. That means God is here. God is there. Shammah, it just literally means there. If you go to Israel today and you, you're in a shop and you're asking for something on the shelf, you can go, Shammah, Shammah, there, there. It, 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 and it says, Jehovah Shammah, God is, he's there, he's here, he's present. God is present. But I want you to just remind you and highlight this one little verse. It says here in Ephesians 3.20, because he says that he can do exceedingly and immeasurably more. More. God can do more. I want to remind you of that. God can do more. Can God say? Yes. And more. Can God heal? Yes. And more. Can God restore? Yes. And more. Can God fix this marriage? Yes. And more. Can God save those people in my life that I'm praying for? Yes. And more. Can God recover this situation? Yes. And more. Can God you know, save this failing business? Yes. And so, so much more. God is more. It's who he is. He is more than enough. He is more than able. He is more than willing. God is more. He is faithful and he will complete what he started, but he is also more, that he will do more than enough in our lives. And I want to just finish with this two verses before we pray for a few people. And it's in Philippians and it's, it's some of my favorite verses and I've, I've preached on it many times. Because how do we have the God of more than enough in our lives? Is it just about, let's just all get fired up and you know, psyched up, pumped up, ready to go? Or is there more to it? I think there is more to it. You see, every Sunday, every service, every opportunity we get, we give people an opportunity to connect their lives with Jesus. And you say, why do we do that? Why do we do this little sales pitch at the end of a sermon? So much more than just a sales pitch. It is the key. It is the number one connection. Your connection that really matters in life, your five, your 10, your connection is not first of all to the church, to a church. Your number one connection in life is to Jesus. Why is that? Well, let's go. Philippians chapter two, verse 12. Paul, he says, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only my presence, but now much more in my absence. This is what's important from here. 
continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And this is where many of us, we stop. It actually says comma, we'll get to the second part of the sentence. But many of us, we put a full stop here. I've got to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And we try and work it out and I'm, I'm fear, I'm trembling and the whole thing has a negative connotation. The whole, whole thing has a negative motivation. It says I work it out, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, comma, because, because, because. So it's, it's connecting what we just read about working out our salvation because it is God who works it in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. So much in this. First of all, God works it in us. He works it in us. What does he work in us? To will and to act. Will is your desire. It's everything that's going on internally. Act is your actions. It's everything externally. So God works it in you, internally and externally. He works it in you so you can work it out. Religion is this. Religion is when you're trying to work something out that you never gave God space to work in. So I try and do better. I try and strive to be a better person. I try to break bad habits. I, 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 I try and fulfill all this religious laws that I, that I can think of, rules and regulations, and I strive. And that's when you meet Christians that are saying, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I'm a bad Christian. What does that even mean? What it means is that you're trying to you, you, you're trying to quantify your walk with Jesus. You're trying to do more good deeds than you do bad deeds. And you're working hard. And that's when you start going, oh, it's so hard being a Christian. You start getting tired. You're like, oh, I'm really trying to be a good Christian. You're not supposed to be try to be a good Christian. This is not something you can work hard at. No, no, no. You give up and you will give God space in your life. He works it in so I can work it out. Can I encourage you in 2021? Don't try and work, work something out that God never worked in. First, your first priority, give God room. Give Jesus space, make, just make space for his grace. That's why your connection to Jesus is the number one thing. Have you ever noticed that so many of the things that we've tried and work out, I've mentioned before Psalm 145, compassion, slow to anger, grace, you know, all these things, those things are fruit of the spirit. Now I can either go, okay, I gotta be slow to anger. So I'm like, I'm, I'm trying not to get angry. I need to be compassionate, all right, you know? I can try and, and strive to be that person or I can be like, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I, I need your help here and I, I need you. And I, and I believe your word is active. I believe it's alive. So I'm going to read some of this. And some of it I don't always get. Some of it confuses me. Some of it, like I need other people to explain it to me. But I'm just going to get it into me because I believe this is active. It's more than information. It's, it's, it's revelation that will create transformation. So Jesus, help. And seriously, some, often my prayer, that's all it is. It's just help. Help Jesus. Help me in my marriage, help me with my kids, help me in lockdown, help me in homeschool. Can, can I get an amen from the parents? You know, just help me, help me in this season. And it's amazing how his grace now suddenly starts to work out. And now I can walk out that which he worked in. Can I please encourage your church? From the outset, 2021, can I encourage you be in the word? Can I encourage you to make space for His grace? We're doing a book of Psalms right now. The first 31 Psalms in the, here in the month of January. And if you haven't got your devotion, make sure you contact us or go to our website and download the PDF. It's just 31 devotions from the book of Psalms. And just start a routine, start a habit where you're making space for His grace. His grace is imparted through the Word. His grace is imparted through prayer, through worship, through fellowship with believers. And let's allow God to transform us as we start to walk out the more that he has for us this year. So I want to just, before we finish, I want to pray just for two groups of people. The first one, it's those of you that you're not connected to Jesus. Look, you might be connected to religion. You might be connected to even church. But to be honest, you're not connected to Jesus. Last week, I, uh, I got a message from someone who, who's been coming to a church for 
years, I, I think. And um, this person just said, and it was not even on a Sunday, it was in midweek. This person said, hey, I'm sitting here, listening to you preach, listening to one of our services. And I'm sitting on my knees with my hands raised. I've been attending church for I don't know how many years, but this was the moment that I connect my life to Jesus. And this person just says, I have now become a Christian, finally. You know, it's why we do what we do. And I don't know where you are at. Maybe you come to church. Maybe you're part of our church. Maybe, you know, you've watched, you watch this and all this stuff, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, have you personally, have you accepted Jesus in your life? Have you had that moment of surrender where you say, this is more than head knowledge. This is heart. This is me saying, Jesus, I want to trust you with my life. I don't want to keep working this out. I want you to work it in me. And I want to trust you as I start to walk this out. And so I want to just pray for you. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. And if, if you say, hey, Thomas, I want to say yes to Jesus. When I say three, wherever you're sitting, whether you're by yourself or other people, just when I say three, why don't you just, just raise your hand? Are you raising it to me? No, because I can't see you. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, when I read my Bible in the morning and I feel guilty and I'm like convicted and I'm just like, I surrender. Hands up, I surrender. That's what it is. It's just you saying, all right, Jesus, I surrender. I need you. I can't do this on my own. So I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, you're saying, I need Jesus. Why don't you just on three, just go, I'm, I surrender. I'm in. <laughs> and then we're going to pray together. Ready? One, two, three. Amazing. Wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, wherever you are physically right now, whoever you're with, what a beautiful, beautiful moment. And we're going to pray together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to say just a line and get you to repeat the, repeat the prayer after me as we surrender our lives to Jesus. So come on, just pray after me. Say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin and my bad mistakes. But today I choose you. I make you my Lord and Savior. From today, I'm a follower of Jesus. I am forgiven and I am free. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Hey, we are so excited for you. And uh, if, we had, if we could be there in the room with you, if you've got friends with you right now that are Christians, they're probably cheering at you, clapping you. Because every good Christian knows that in that moment, we kind of look at our friends with one eye open. And why do we do that? Why do we cheer? Why do we get excited? Why are so many people writing clapping emojis right now in this? We do that because we know what is meant for us. We know the moment we stop trying to work this out in our own power and actually just gave space for His grace, man, that moment changed everything for us. And we, we know it has the potential to do the same for you. But we also want to encourage you and help you if we can. And uh, if you contact us uh, at next at hillsong.dk or find us online on hillsong.dk, but next at hillsong.dk, if you contact us, we'd love to send you a Bible. We just, I'm talking so much about the Bible in this message, but we want to send you a New Testament Bible in either Danish, English, or Swedish. And, um, and, and it just as your gift, and you can say, all right, 2021, this Bible, it is a symbol. It's a, it's, this is to remind me, this is the year that I got right with Jesus. So why don't you just send us an email, plus we'd love to contact you with any local church where they love Jesus, they love people, and, and get you connected to a local fellowship. We're never created to do life on our own, and we're definitely not created to do Christianity on our own. We're supposed to be in this together. And we'd love to see you in person if we can, if you live near any of our campuses, any of our locations, whether it's in Denmark, Sweden, or anywhere in the world. We'd love to see you connected in that way as well. Can I pray for one more group before we go? And that's for any of you that just, man, you're just up for it. 2021, you just wanna make a decision. To so this year, you wanna just make space for His grace. You wanna just make space. You just wanna make space. You wanna just say, okay, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. Yes, I believe in Ephesians 3.20, I wanna see them more. Yes, I believe in Philippians 1.6, yeah, I wanna see you complete what you started. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to making a decision. I've got to make a decision. I've got to take the time. I've got to take the energy. I've got to take the moment where I say, Jesus, help, <laughs> SOS, help, mayday. And then if you make that decision, I want to just pray for you. But then also trust that this is not just going to be a desire, not just going to be a prayer, 
but you're actually going to make some decisions, make some changes in your routine, whether it's get up a little bit earlier, whether it's, you know, put Netflix aside for just half an hour, an hour, five minutes, whatever, but make a decision. Maybe it's, it's downloading the, the Psalm devotion that we're doing together and just say, okay, I'm going to do those 31 days. The next 31 days, I'm going to do this, take time out. And I'm going to believe that we're going to see something so powerful in your life. Because as you open up for his input, man, there was no telling what the output can be. Let me pray for you. If that's you, if you're saying that's me, I want to I do that. Why don't you raise your hand? This is not just for new Christians. This is not just for new believers. Why don't you say, hey, I'm in. I'm in. I, I, want, I want to make space for his grace. So Jesus, I thank you for all of us. I, I'm, I'm committing myself again, Lord Jesus. I, I want to make more space for your grace. Lord, I, I, want, I want you to move in our lives, Lord God. And I pray for every person now that's making a decision, saying, Jesus, I need you. I want you. I, I, want, I need your help in my life. Lord Jesus, let's pray for your, your favor over their lives. I pray 2021, man, that by the end of this year, we're going to look back and just see that you did so much more, more, more. You completed what you started and then so much more. So let's pray for every person as they make choices now to change routines and, and things in their lives, Lord God. Just, just be with them. Be present, Lord God. Have your way in and through our lives. We lift up our friends, our family, those who don't know you this year, Lord God. We pray this is the year of salvation for our friends, for our loved ones. Lord, we lift them up and we just pray, keep your hand over them, Lord Jesus. And may we see many, many, many people find you from the whosoever, Lord Jesus, all the way through to the least life, Lord God. Have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. Hey, thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, Phil Hulgo is going to come and, and finish off the service. But we love you. Have an amazing day, a week, and whenever you're watching this. Man, we just love you so much. We're so excited for this year. Didn't start maybe how we had hoped and wanted to, but it's okay. God is still God, and we're just so expectant for everything this year is going to bring to us as a country, as a globe, but also as a church and as individuals. So God bless you, and we'll see you soon.